dear friends who are sitting on that side of the pillar perhaps all of you may want to come here it'll be easier i think uh, for everyone to uh, so good afternoon friends uh, welcome to this uh, session on retinal emergencies for the comprehensive ophthalmologist uh, the aim of this course uh, is basically to enable the comprehensive ophthalmologist to mesh the symptoms and fundus findings and uh, arrive at uh, at least a presumptive diagnosis or a, a, a group of differential diagnosis uh, uh, and not the most important thing is not to miss out on something critical which would be vision threatening and or life threatening uh, so our opening batsman uh, uh, by we have a you know a galaxy of speakers today uh, they are all past masters uh, in their own right uh, dr vatsal parekh dr karobi lairi uh, dr uh, ashish vaidya dr sharad bomaj and dr uh, drashti uh, so uh, i don't think they need any introduction really they are all thank you uh, so our opening batsman is dr vatsal parekh uh, he'll speak to us uh, about uh, sudden loss of vision and how to wade your way to the diagnosis udhar jao thanks dr paritosh in this brief presentation i am just going to take you to certain salient features of history taking and what you should be looking at so the topic given is sudden loss of vision and how to come to diagnosis now causes of sudden loss of vision could be transient vision loss where vision returns to normal within 24 hours usually within 1 hour or vision loss which lasts more than 24 hours the causes would differ now when it's transient vision loss when it's for few seconds it could be usually bilateral papilledema or when there is papilledema patient may get up with blurring of vision or when there is a post change in posture the vision may be blurred for few seconds few minutes classically we tell it as transient ischemic attack or amaurosis fugax sometimes when it's bilateral it could be vertebral basilar artery insufficiency but when it's more than 10 minutes up to 1 hours it's usually ophthalmic migraine with or without headache here patient usually can have some aura or something you know seeing flashes or something now vision loss last lasting longer than 24 hours can be sudden painless loss gradual painless loss or painful loss now sudden painless loss could be ischemic optic neuropathy or more important would be artery occlusion now i i say artery occlusion is important because sometimes in a busy opd the patient may have artery occlusion and he complains and you are busy so he stunt come up after one and a half hour two hours and you realize that he has artery occlusion so i think when you see a patient with marked drop in vision and there is relative afferent pupillary defect there should be some way to shortcut and see that patient especially when it's artery occlusion because probably sometimes if you are lucky do paracentesis and the vision may improve and the embolus or something dislodges you know so i think this is important also important is when you are at home and patient says that there is sudden loss of vision and we call him next day for examination or because it's sunday so probably these are the things to keep in mind then other cause could be vitreous hemorrhage due to any cause retinal detachment would not be so sudden but patient may realize suddenly and optic neuritis is another common cause where there usually would be painful eye movements now painless uh, painful vision loss is optic neuritis and most important is endophthalmitis acute endophthalmitis especially when you have operated a patient for cataract and suddenly complains of pain and loss of vision you have to suspect that it could be infectious end of thalmitis and examine that patient at the earliest you know and sometimes it could be non infectious uveitis also 
gradual painless loss of vision could be because of ARMD or diabetic retinopathy or even vein occlusion can be gradual or when patient suddenly closes one eye he realizes that other eye he has no vision or less vision. Now this is a classic case of optic neuritis with optic disc swelling and engorged vessels. You will have relative afferent pupillary defect also and uh, color vision would be affected. Now this is classic cherry red spot or this is infarcted retina. So this is all whitish in appearance. This is branch artery occlusion and this is a thrombus here. <clears throat> Our friend Dr. Nishkant Bose had popularized vitrectomy and maneuvering this thrombus or massaging this but I think <clears throat> it has not picked up well and probably it's not having better curation, curative rate compared to natural course. <clears throat> in a cherry red spot you will see the entire cherry red spot here. So this is something a medical emergency <clears throat> and you need to investigate patient for systemic disease especially uh, carotid artery occlusion or thrombus or any valvular problem in the heart from where, where embolus can get dislodged. Now these are typical central retinal vein occlusion where the hemorrhages are all round or there could be branch retinal vein occlusion where there would be hemorrhages in one quadrant. The vision loss is because of the macular edema and this is a classic case of retinal detachment. There would be retinal tear and loss of vision. So. Again, history is important in retinal detachment that patient, intelligent patient will say that I am not able to see in a particular quadrant. I had a patient whom I had operated for detachment in one eye and had silicon oil removed one day. He says that he is not able to see again in the same eye in a temporal quadrant. So as a routine examination, we always dilate both eyes and he had detachment in the nasal quadrant in the other eye. So this is important to know that you always examine both eyes. Patient may not realize which eye he has less vision, you know. Now, this is a classic case of vitreous hemorrhage where you can see the details of retina here in the periphery and these are the hemorrhages which is obscuring the vision. So, these are all photographs which we discussed of sudden painful loss of vision. Now, chronic loss of vision, this is a case of weight ARMD with lot of scarring in the retina since you can see the blood vessels over it intact it is subretinal scarring. So this diagnosis would be weight age related macular degeneration in an elderly gentleman. Whereas here this is a dry macular degeneration looks like dry but if you see the OCT there is fluid. So this eye would need immediate treatment you know. Now this is classic diabetic retinopathy proliferative type and this is diabetic macular edema which again would present as loss of vision or gradual loss of vision. So these are the photographs what you saw. This is an extreme case of endophthalmitis but minimal and uh, minimal hypopion you can miss especially when patient complains of painful drop in vision you have to look carefully on slit lamp and look for flare cells and hypopion and vitreous haze. The treatment would depend on that. So when you examine the patient you check the visual acuity you see the cornea whether it's clear or there is edema you see the pupil reaction especially RAPD would be there in optic neuritis and uh, artery occlusion. You look for anterior chamber lens, IOP because acute congestive glaucoma also can give rise to painful blind eye and iris for new vessels especially for new vascular glaucoma. You see the media for vit uh, vitreous whether there is vitreous hemorrhage or anything else. Ret uh, disc for optic neuritis and pallor, macula for edema, hemorrhage and general fundus for retinal detachment or an, any active retinitis or choroiditis lesion or retinal hemorrhages. So I think with a proper history and proper examination most of the time you can just come to diagnosis without any ancillary examination like B scan or ultra wide field photography. What you need is a detailed history and a careful open your eyes to be widely open and mind to be widely open to come to a provisional diagnosis. Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you very much, Batsal Bhai. It was an excellent uh, eye-opener. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's very important whenever a patient, uh, particularly at the weekends uh, or on a Sunday evening when the patient calls you with sudden loss of vision, uh, you need to dissect out just based on history. And if it's a total blackout, uh, then there's a very high risk that it might be a central retinal artery occlusion. Uh, please drop your work and 
go and attend to that patient because there's a good chance uh, that you may be able to salvage something at least. And uh, as Dr. Watsalbai mentioned, um, retinal angioplasty, uh, the results have been kamsi kamsa. I mean, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But certainly paracentesis, good old paracentesis and digital massage and IV mannitol, it uh, does work in many cases still, especially when there are not multiple emboli or a long uh, embolus. Okay, so please, uh, uh, you know, uh, use the opportunity and save the vision. Uh, we'll keep questions for the end. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Drashti Raichura. She is an upcoming vitreoretinal surgeon, uh, practices in Mumbai. Uh, so she is going to talk about uh, spots in the field of vision. So what could they be? Good afternoon, one and all. Thank you, Dr. Paritosh, sir, for giving me this opportunity. So my topic is, I see spots in my visual fields, and what could they be? So a vitreous floater, or known as myodespsia in Greek, or musque volitantis in Latin, is nothing but a clump of microcollagen which condenses and casts a shadow on the retina, which the patient sees in the visual field. It uh, can occur due to vitreous synergesis or liquefaction and contraction with age. Also, it could occur due to trauma and injury. So the patient will present with either floaters or bubbles or cobwebs, or dark spots, bugs or thread likes floating in the visual field, which move with the movement of the eye. They are more seen in dim illumination, more in the temporal visual field. Uh, now, if we ask on history, the uh, floaters or scotomas due to the vitreous floaters will move even after the cessation of eye movement, whereas a scotoma or uh, you know a defect which is seen due to a corneal or macular or lens pathology will remain constant. So this is what the patient will um, see and if you see in this diagram very nicely it has been depicted how these floaters cast a shadow on the retina which the patient sees in the visual field. So primary floaters are due to endogenous structures of the vitreous that is the collagen. So patient will classically complain of glass noodle or um, spider web like appearance. And secondary floaters are due to exogenous structures in the vitreous like amyloid blood, implants, parasites or foreign bodies. So primary vitreous floaters, the most common cause is posterior vitreous detachment where the patient may complain of seeing the vices ring or ring like uh, floater or there could be vitreoretinal disorders like Stickler syndrome or Wagner disease. Secondary vitreous floaters can occur due to retinal or uh, pre-retinal or vitreous hemorrhages. There could be breaks, tears uh, or you know operculum in the retina associated with or without retinal detachment. Um, sometimes very rarely due to asteroid hyalosis which is significantly dense enough to cause uh, floaters or intraocular injections or remnants post VR surgery. So when a patient presents to you, how should you go about? So the first most important thing is a very detailed history taking, which we'll uh, cover in the subsequent slides, followed by slit lamp biomicroscopy with our 60 or 90D lens, a peripheral fundus examination with scleral depression in both the eyes, documentation either in the form of a mechanical drawing or imaging if available, and last but not the least, counseling the patient. So in the history, you have to elicit whether it's an acute or a chronic problem. Uh, what is the number and density of the floaters if it has there is any increase since the time it started um, also you should find out about metabolic disorders if the patient is suffering from any diabetes which could lead to vitreous hemorrhage or hypertension any previous history of retinal diseases like retinal detachment in the other eye then you know that you know you should look more keenly for a break in this eye which is complaining of vascular occlusions and any ocular surgery like cataract or uh, vr surgery cataract surgery especially if there's been an event full cataract surgery where there could be some remnant cortical or epinuclear fragments in the anterior segment or posterior segment. So on slit lamp biomicroscopy, uh, through a 60D lens, these images have been taken. And here in the first image, you can see the in the superior uh, uh, periphery, the floater, which we can see. Here it is just next to the disc, I think because of the contrast, we cannot see the disc. And here uh, you can see a kind of vices ring PVD. This is a video which we have taken with on the slit lamp with the 60D. So if you look, you have to basically increase the brightness so that the there is more light thrown on the retina. So that the light which comes on the vitreous thrown from there will show you the uh, you know ring very nicely here. 
so this is through slit lamp bio microscopy this is how you should examine the vitreous this is another video which is taken on the slit lamp so you should basically like i said increase the um, light on the retina you are now you can once you focus on the retina you bring the joystick a little forward focus anteriorly and very beautifully you can see the vitreous movement i mean here there is a liquefaction of the vitreous and so very nicely you can elicit that just on your slit lamp examination i think due to lack of contrast you cannot see it very well okay okay sorry i am not able to see it probably so the most common cause being posterior vitreous detachment which is an age related common process where patient will complain with sudden onset of floaters there is separation of the posterior vitreous cortex from the ilm of the retina progressively extending up to the vitreous base so it is basically liquefaction along with vitreo retinal dehiscence which allows the li liquid vitreous to enter the pre retinal space these patients need to be kept under a very close observation and we have to explain the importance of that to them so on wide field wide field imaging this is what the posterior vitreous detachment would look like and the next cause being vitreous hemorrhage which can occur due to pvd with traction on the retinal vessels ischemic conditions leading to neovascularization like diabetes retinal tears which involve the retinal vessels and hence lead to the hemorrhage trauma neoplasms rare anomalies like exlink skysis tickler syndrome and retinal detachment with pigment uh, release so these are pictures of vitreous hemorrhage where you can see that the periphery of the retina can be seen and the hemorrhage is in the center these are cortical spokes but you just can't go with the image clinical correlation with the lens status is also important so that needs to be ascertained these are streak intragel hemorrhages so these patients also can present with floaters um any avulsed retinal tissue like a break or a tear or an operculum uh, can also these patients can also present with uh, floaters and hence uh, uh, indirect examination of both the eyes uh, you know with scleral depression is of utmost importance asteroid hyalosis very rarely will present with uh, floaters but if it's dense enough and if the number is too much then the patient may rarely present with floaters asteroid hyalosis is nothing but cal calcium pyrophosphate crystals and as such they cause minimal disturbance intraocular injections in the form of anti vegfs or dexamethasone implants or ivta crystals could themselves present with floaters but eventually they resolve with time even the small amount of air which sometimes goes into the vitreous cavity can present as a floater post vr surgery any remnant pfcl or silicon oil bubbles which have been left behind so um, this is a picture of a retinal tear with a detachment which uh, i think subsequently ashish sir is going to cover um, this is an operculum this is asteroid hyalosis um, here it is significant enough and on slit lamp examination also you can uh, appreciate the same here we've taken a video on slit lamp to show how that movement is seen so during your slit lamp examination or you should have an eye out for it this is a shadow of the osudex implant on the retina and this patient you can actually we have been able to capture the implant so these patients also uh, complain of seeing a cigar like floater in the vitreous field uh, in the visual field this is gas after vr surgery this is in the form of a single bubble and here there are multiple bubbles um here this patient was complaining of a floater which on clinical examination we were not able to find the reason for but when we took the wide field imaging we saw that there was one remnant silicon oil bubble which had been missed on examination but luckily on the uh, you know photography we could i mean on imaging we could pick it up and then we knew that that was the cause of the floater so patient counseling is very important regarding frequent follow ups especially when you know there is a pvd you should see them every week or so uh, for the first month and then you know you can increase the duration gradually so that if there are any breaks or anything which develop you catch them in time and you prevent the patient from going into an rd and undergoing surgery subsequently you have to explain to the patient that they have to inform sos if there is an increase in the number of floaters or they see flashes or there is a drop in vision um and if uh, you don't find any other cause you should also get the necessary blood work up done to find out uh, for diabetes and all uh, to find out for the other causes of vitreous hemorrhage as well i thank you all for your patient hearing thank you drashti for a wonderful presentation uh, uh 
you know, all my patients, we common, all the retinal patients, we commonly counsel them to remember certain warning symptoms. So apart from a sudden drop in vision or waviness, that's metamorphopsia, we tell them about uh, uh, to watch out for a sudden onset of new floaters or a, a sudden shower or fountain of red, brown or black dots lasting 15, 30 seconds uh, and then again vision becomes clear or flashes of light like lightning in the evening darkness or night on moving the head or the eyes. Uh, uh, so if any of these are seen, then uh, uh, these are warning symptoms of uh, a serious retinal pathology and we tell them to report immediately. So talking of flashes, our next speaker, Dr. Ashish Vaidya, is going to talk to us about uh, flashes and floaters. Thank you, Paditosh, for inviting me here. My talk for today is going to be vitreous flashes. And as Dushti said, flashes and floaters go hand in glove with each other. So very often you have both of them very rarely you have only one. Let's go into a brief thing about the anatomy of the eye. Uh, the slides are not changing. Slide is not changing. Sorry about this. So, even as a general ophthalmologist, we should know what is the anatomy of the peripheral retina. We have the past retina and we have the ora serrata and we have the vitreous brace which straddles the ora serrata into the past retina. There are various vitreous adhesions which are there which are physiological and pathological. You can have uh, adhesions to the peripheral retinal lesions. You can have vitreomacular traction and adhesion to the preretinal blood vessels. Now, the question arises as to what are true flashes and what are not. So flashes of light are pinprick spots of light that you see in your field of vision. Suddenly you will see something blinking over here, going off. Blinking over here, going off. So these flashes of light in your vision come from inside the eye. They are not caused by outside lights or anything else outside your body. And the flashes of light usually appear and then fade away quickly. Now this is a very important thing. They fade away quickly in a, in a matter of about you know a few seconds. At the most 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Why do these flashes occur? They occur because of stimulation of the retinal photoreceptors by the traction of the vitreous gel. So this is very important to remember. Now these are sometimes people have described them as pinpricks, spots of light, shooting stars or lightning streaks. Many of your patients say that it starts from you or goes around. So these are all basically flashes of light. This can be exacerbated by coughing or valsalva manual. Sometimes you get up in the middle of the night coughing away you may see some flashes of light in your periphery. They can happen because of trauma, because of stimulation of the photoreceptors. They can sometimes happen because of severe rubbing of the eyes also. And sometimes in some patients, even saccades, that just movement of the eyes can trigger off these flashes. So true flashes, what are they? True flashes are basically because of stimulation of the retinal photoreceptors, because of traction of the vitreous gel. So this typically happens in patients with a PVD in which changes in the vitreous gel causes a change in the consistency. The vitreous gel becomes liquid and separates from the retina. You can also have flashes associated with the retinal detachment, proliferative diabetic retinopathy because they can be pulled on the retina because of the scar tissue and retinal tear. Also because of vitreomacular traction. Flashes of light can occur because of various other conditions also like collateral neovascular membranes, cytomegalous virus retinitis, torn retina, migraine, PVD, stickler syndrome, etc. Now what are not true flashes? In a migraine patient, you have flashes because of constriction of the blood vessels. They are not directly because of stimulation of the photoreceptors. And these are sensory symptoms that can occur. Migraine aura is some symptoms which can happen before or after the headache. Now in the contrast, what happens is that these occur as zigzag lines. They may be colorful. And typically the patient can say that I don't see vision in a particular field. This basically happens because of migraine, because of spasm of the blood vessels. Here you can see this red and green and yellow lights which are there in a zigzag fashion. This is the way a typical patient with migraine will present to you. And these are not because of pull on the retina which we are most worried about. Then you can have something called as pseudo flashes which happen after cataract surgery. 
the, this is seen because of reflections due to new lens. If you have a lens with a very high refractive index, then when light shines on the eye in a particular way, you can have you know suddenly a streak of light which goes. Or in some of these newer lenses which are there, the patient complains of a cut off of this vision and a circular flash kind of thing. And this typically happens in the left eye. God knows why it happens in the left eye, but that's the way it's been described. It happens more in the left eye than the right eye. Then you can have glare. This glare can be because of high refractive index IOLs, which is described as light streaks. It is also described as starbursts due to black backscatter of the light. It can be again because of light scars due to the uh, light arcs because of edge of the IOL and rings and halos. Now this is a, taken from cataract coach. If you can see over here, these are various things which are described by the patient as a flash, but these are not two flashes or two true floaters. You know, these are just halos around the light, the way it's been described. Even here, if you just see through your windshield, if you're driving in the night, if you see through your windshield, you see that each of these light has a scatter around it. This is a normal patient with a normal car windshield. And sometimes these are also misinterpreted by the patient as a flash. Here you can have a patient again with the affected vision over here because of some of the lenses you can see it like this. Now a dry eye can exacerbate all these symptoms. So you, have, you may have a patient who's just done cataract surgery and because of any of this phenomenon along with a dry eye he suddenly starts seeing more flashes of light and sometimes just putting a couple of uh, drops of uh, you know methyl cellulose or something can reduce these flashes. Then sometimes flashes can happen after LASIK surgery. This is when the LASIK cup is applied and the suction is induced. At that time, there can be stimulation of the photoreceptors and patient can get flashes. And usually, again, these flashes go away. But it is also important to remember that these flashes can be associated with a retinal tear in some of these patients because many of these patients are high myopes. Then how do you differentiate between retinal cause, migraine, and halos? In a retinal cause, the flashes appear and disappear quickly. In migraine, you have zigzag lines, bright spots, which can happen with or without aura and sometimes you can have a headache. Now what are alarming signs? If you have a sudden increase in flashes of floaters, that is a very different alarming sign. You have to examine these patients immediately and as what Dr. Vatsal Parikh said, you have to examine both eyes of these patients. As retinal surgeons, very often we see that patient has PVD in one eye, there's no lesion in that eye, but in the other eye has had a retinal tear because of a PVD about three months ago and that tear has been missed. So in such a case, we need to treat the other eye with the laser. You also have to remember that if the area of visual field has got cut off, then it could be a retinal detachment. I think these, some of these things uh, the stay has already taken, so I think we'll go a little fast on this. So when a patient complains of black spots without flashes of floaters, how would you examine? You have to examine both eyes of the patient. Now sometimes you have a streak hemorrhage in this patient, the patient is having flashes. You examine the patient, the patient has no tail. What do you do? The first thing I would do is ask the patient to wait outside, examine him five minutes later again. Because if there's a small streak hemorrhage, very often there's a chance that I have missed a break. So I would like to examine that patient five or ten minutes later, fully dilated, again see the patient and maybe you can find a small break somewhere. So this is something which is extremely important. So it's important to know that flashes and floaters require a detailed vitreoretinal examination to rule that out. Now, how would you manage an acute PVD? I think the has already explained already most of the things. You have to have a dilated examination. The high risk features are blood obscuring the details. Again, I repeat, if there is blood, there has to be a tear in 95% of patients. So if you're not finding a tear, examine again, again, and again. Okay, here you have a small thing, which is a floater over here with flash. And as we said, how do you examine again? It's very important that you have to examine the patient with an indirect ophthalmoscope with scleral depression. Direct ophthalmoscope, you can only see the posterior pole, nothing more than that. You don't have binocular vision. So you have to have an indirect ophthalmoscope, dilate the pupils, and examine the patient with scleral depression. Many of these fancy equipments which are there, which are wide field fundus cameras, wide field fundus cameras do not show you 100% of the retina. They show you about 80 to 90% of the retina, but in that remaining 10%, you may have a tear which is there. And hence, you, uh, just a fundus picture with a white field camera is not enough. In all patients with flashes and floaters, you have to have indirect examination with scleral depression. Again, here you can see multiple pigmentation over here. 
and there can be various types of tears which are there. Here you can see again a tear over here. Here you can see tear at the posterior pole. Again, this will give rise to a flash because of traction over here. Again, there's a tear, a horseshoe tear over here which will give rise to flashes of light. So in all these patients, you have to be careful. The risk factors, RD in fellow eye, family history, cataract or YAG laser. If a patient complains of flashes of floaters after the YAG laser, be sure your uh, PVD has been induced. Dilate the patient and have a look at it. There can be symptomatic tears, traction on the edge of the tears, the location of tears and fluid around the edge. Here you can see large tear which has been completely lasered off. Now if you can just one, yeah. If you see this picture over here, this is the posterior pole picture. Looks normal. What does it show? It's absolutely normal. But look at this part over here. This is what you will see in a direct ophthalmoscope or it's just a fundus picture. Here you can see a little bit of abnormality. You go to that area and you can see a superior retinal detachment. So if you see it with a in direct ophthalmoscope, you're only examining this part. You're telling the patient, go home. But that's not true. You, the, you are missing a retinal detachment. So hence, I repeat, you have to do an indirect ophthalmoscopy with a sterile depression. So in some of these patients, we need to do B-scan. Uh, and to conclude, the most important thing is that patient has to have, you have to do patient counseling. You have to have realistic expectations on these patients. You have to tell the patient if your flashes are increasing, your floaters are increasing, you have to come back again. And we have to do a repeat examination, maybe once every three days, once every week also if possible, till the time you are sure that there's no tear in this patient. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish, for a wonderful presentation. Dr. Ashish Vaidya is a senior vitreoretinal uh, surgeon in Mumbai. Uh, uh, one thing which uh, uh, all um, uh, comprehensive ophthalmologists, uh, can, in fact, uh, you can detect uh, the possibility of a tear, apart from the points which Ashish highlighted in, on history taking, uh, uh, when you look at the patient on the slit lamp and if you find tobacco dusting in the anterior vitreous, there's a very high chance that this eye has got one or more retinal tears. So look at those eyes extremely carefully. Uh, another scenario is post YAG capsulotomy. Uh, post YAG capsulotomy, uh, different studies report rates of 2% to 40% of retinal tears. So after doing a YAG capsulotomy, uh, please call the patient back, not only for a glass appointment, but also to look at the retina with dilatation and with indirect ophthalmoscopy with scleral depression. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Sharad Bomaj. He's a senior vitreoretinal specialist uh, from Miraj. Uh, he is going to speak to us about whitish, yellowish whales seen on fundus examination. Uh, what are we dealing with? So there's a, <coughs> a lot of overlap uh, between the to topics. So anyway, um, uh, what we are dealing here with um, some whitish or yellowish opacities in the vitreous and what are the signs which you see on fundus examination. So it could be either a vitreous degeneration as discussed earlier, either a standalone age-related vitreous degeneration or associated with some other ocular pathology like schesis, FEVR, sticklers, all those kind of things. It could be a uh, another kind of retinal degeneration like uh, uh, asteroid halosis or synchysis. It could be in vitreous inflammation like vitreitis or sometimes even a white spot can be an old vitreous hemorrhage. So um, as discussed, you know, uh, uh, this is the most common vitreous opacity which you see in the fundus. That is a uh, vitreous um, uh, floater which is a wise ring. So if it is a not an acute condition, uh, Obviously, you will have to examine all these patients with scleral indentation. But if it's not an acute condition, maybe it's not that sinister. And in some patients who are undergoing YAC capsulotomy, uh, it could be uh, reducing the incidence of detachment post YAC. If there is no PVD, they have got a higher risk of developing a retinal tear. So um, the most important thing as discussed by all the speakers is that 
examine the fundus properly so that you don't miss the retinal tears or a subclinical detachment. So it could be a very serious condition. You could have a, a macula on detachment and even a giant retinal tear which is macula on. So the thing which we have to do is the laser and uh, you can save the patient from further problems. So the next uh, kind of um, uh, conditions which you see is that when you examine the fundus, you see floaters but you see multiple lattices. So in this kind of uh, lattices which are very irregular, radial, paravascular, multiple, uh, oblique, not necessarily circumferential, they indicate that this patient is having a serious uh, vitreoretinal disorder. So if this patient are having coexistent systemic features like cleft palate, cleft lip, uh, sensory neural he he uh, hearing loss, uh, all these kind of systemic associations, it could be a case of stickler syndrome. So in these kind of lattices, uh, we don't do anything, but we do observe. So uh, we don't uh, actually treat these patients, we observe. So unless there are retinal tears, uh, we don't treat. So more extensive the lesions, we be on the defensive side. If you have limited uh, degenerative lesions with holes, we treat those patients. So uh, if you have multiple lattices and also you have pigmentary retinal degeneration, then uh, along without a systemic manifestations, this could be a Wagner syndrome. So uh, something you will have a, a radial lattices and other lot of lattices in the peripheral fundus, but along with that you will have pigmentary changes in the fundus. So these are patients of Wagner syndrome. So next uh, pathology which you can have with a whitish or a, a vitreous opacity, which is not the routine vitreous degeneration, is the FEVR. So this uh, uh, is a very important disease, um, quite high association with myopia. It can be unilateral and sometimes even bilateral. The, the most important thing is that you can have a disc drag. So if you see a disc drag and you cannot reach the uh, vessels in the periphery, so there will be a varying area of avascular retina where the vessels, if you trace to the periphery, these vessels are stopping short, they are not reaching the aura. So when you examine the peripheral fundus, you will find that these vessels are stopping just short of the periphery. So the extent varies a lot. And these patients can sometimes develop a vitreous hemorrhage or a vitreous degeneration. And uh, this on the second top, this is a patient with a FEVR presenting with a vitreous hemorrhage, which is old. So he's got white. Uh, floaters inside the eye and it's an old vitreous hemorrhage. So this is a patient with 360 degree uh, kind of avascular retina in a FEVR patient. So these patients uh, need uh, laser treatment to the avascular retina depending on the individual scenario. So some patients who are asymptomatic and don't have much kind of signs, very small asymptomatic patients, uh, they can observe. So observation versus treatment that you have to take the decision in due course of time after detailed follow of the patients. Some of these patients may not always have a disc drag or uh, vascular problems. Uh, they can directly present to you with these avascular areas. And obviously, detachments are very common. So this is one of the patients of FEVR, uh, which presented with lotus. And this vision is uh, 6 by 6. But you can see the extent of avascular retina is reaching almost a you know, couple of disc diameters away from the fovea. So this is the patient which we need to treat and uh, need to follow. So the next uh, kind of um, signs which we see with a vitreous floater inside the eye are, uh, is could be a retinoschisis. So what is actually happening in the retinoschisis is that there is a split in the retinal layers and because the split is occupied by a transparent retina, this inner part of the retina is the blood vessels which are there, they are appearing floating in the uh, vitreous cavity. So you will see floating blood vessels or floating uh, vitreous floaters. So you will have like this. And uh, when you, uh, you can see, uh, these are all actually the blood vessels which are floating uh, in the vitreous cavity and they are on the inner layers of the schesis. So on the OCT, you will see the typical splitting of the retinal layers. And most of these patients, unless they develop a, a regmatogenous element, we just need to observe. So there is no treatment for this degenerative condition. We just need to observe. So there is no role of any laser or anything. Just if, unless the patient develops a schesis, uh, ret retinal detachment, we don't treat these patients. Again, these are some of the patients where you have got a, a retinoschesis, bullous elevation. So the next uh, group of um, vitreous uh, floaters with whitish and yellowish objects are very commonly asteroid hyalosis. So they have got some typical features. One is that most of the time, 
you can see these floaters but the patients may not always complain of floaters and their vision may be excellent so that's because the light can pass through that and the shadows which are uh, shadow uh, casted on the retina are very small so they don't disturb the vision and on ultrasound suppose this is a patient of mature cataract many times we uh, get referred that this patient of um, cataract with vitreous hemorrhage so on ultrasound it has got a very typical feature it has got a clear vitreous uh, and a quick part behind a clump of vitreous opacity. So this is a very classical uh, finding on the B scan which is very characteristic for asteroid hyalosis. So we will see a clear and a quick uh, uh, area of the vitreous which is pre-retinal. So suppose you have this is a patient of uh, diabetic retinopathy. So in a case of asteroid hyalosis we need to do a, a proper slit lamp examination reduce the size of the slit beam and look for the diabetic retinopathy in diabetic patients and in case uh, there is a proliferative changes or thing you can you can do the uh, PRP laser if it is more dense then uh, you can take the aid of a uh, OCT because this is monochromatic light can pass through the asteroid hyalosis whereas white light will get back scattered that's why you're not able to see the fundus but if you use a monochromatic light like a OCT or autofluorescence you are able to capture the retinal details so in the OCT you can see in the right eye there is no traction element so he has got undergone PRP in the left eye there is a traction you can see there is a retinal elevation and this indicates that uh, uh, and because of the density of the opacity we have to do vitrectomy for this patient but these patients of uh, 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 this uh, asteroid hyalosis can have a lot of vitreous cases and it can be missed and then they can develop a detachment so a vitrectomy in a asteroid hyalosis should not be taken lightly so autofluorescence is a good modality to image these patients of asteroid hyalosis. So this is a patient of diabetic, proliferative diabetic retinopathy showing multiple uh, NVE on the FFA and this needs to be lasered. But you can see that it's very difficult to see the laser spots because of the uh, asteroids. So you can take care of the, uh, you can do the uh, wide field autofluorescence of this patient and you can see that the uh, uh, fresh laser spots will appear hyper autofluorescent and the uncovered areas will be showing you where the laser has not been done so it helps you to guide where you have done the laser where you have not done the laser and of course if the asteroids are very dense then you will have to do vitrectomy uh, along with that so a variant of this vitreous uh, white or yellowish floaters is uh, cholesterol deposits inside the eye so in this uh, synchysis scintillans or the cholesterol lesus patients have got a uh, primary uh, ocular pathology that could be a old trauma inflammation vitreous hemorrhage so after that you get cholesterol deposits. So always these patients have got uh, less vision, suboptimal vision because of the underlying disease. And these patients could be young and they could be bilateral and uh, the, they will have visual impairment because they have got a pre-existing disease unlike the asteroid hyalosis. So these uh, are again a rare case. Uh, you will not see it very commonly. This is a amyloidosis. So in case the vitreous uh, opacities are very dense causing problems to, of the vision to the patient, you will have to do a vitrectomy with PVD induction and base dissection because uh, residual vitreous left the amyloidosis again proliferates in that area. So you have to do a complete vitrectomy. So you can have other kind of uh, opacities in the vitreous which are white and yellow. This could be residual triamcinone crystals like in this patient. Sometimes you are given intravital injections and these intravital injections can precipitate like vancomycin and uh, ceftazidime and you can have whitish opacities. So uh, uh, these are some of the things. If uh, you have got signs of inflammation, uh, then this is vitritis. So examine on, don't forget to examine the anterior segment, very important. So the key to whether it is vitritis or not is to uh, exactly take the proper evaluation of the anterior segment. So if you have a uh, look, in a case of vitritis, always look for a uh, spot, I mean whitish or yellowish opacity on the retina. So this could be an infective pathology and uh, you, you, it most common causes toxoplasmosis. So you can have uh, acute retinal necrosis. So basically to uh, uh, summarize the case of vitritis is that you have to do a good examination of the uh, retina to rule out infective conditions. So this is one of the case of ARN which was treated with periocular steroid and it went on to involve the macula. So any case of vitritis uh, don't uh, take it lightly, rule out infective causes and then you should treat. So uh, non-infective cause like intermediate uitis is a diagnosis of exclusion. So on endophthalmitis, again, uh, they can have anterior segment signs of uh, cells, flare, hypopion. It's easier to diagnose. Only thing to remember mm -hmm. is that in an opaque uh, anterior segment where you cannot see the fundus, uh, ultrasound may not be very reliable. So you have to rely on the anterior segment signs and the overall clinical picture to decide about the diagnosis. 
So some of the distribution of these floaters, uh, I mean uh, distribution of these opacities can point to some diagnosis. Like in this case of fungal endophthalmitis, you can have uh, these uh, string of pearls and clumps which are actually pointing towards a candida infection. At extremes of age, uh, beware that these patients can have malignancies. So this is a young child with vitreous floaters, uh, vitreous opacities, whitish vitreous opacities, but these are actually seeds from the retinoblastoma. And you can see on the right top there is a retinoblastoma lesion. So these are retinoblastoma patients with vitreous seedings. And at uh, uh, elderly or middle-aged patients, if they are observed with subretinal uh, infiltrates and other things, they can be a presenting feature of lymphoma. So there are various uh, signs which are there on the OCT which helps you to clink the diagnosis apart from the histopathology. Again, uh, differentiating old vitreous hemorrhage and vitritis is the key is to uh, examine the entry segment properly. So in the entry segment, if they are absolutely quiet, then uh, uh, it can be. Uh, so this is another patient of vitreous uh, opacity. This is a retinal dialysis with a vitreous base avulsion. So, thank you. Uh, I could discuss some of the causes of the whitish or yellowish floaters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bomaj, for an excellent presentation. I uh, now call uh, upon Dr. Karobi Lahiri. She's a very senior uh, vitreoretinal specialist from Mumbai, like uh, Dr. Vatsal Parekh, also very senior retinal specialist from Mumbai. So, Dr. Karobi will talk to us about red and yellow spots seen on fundus examination. So, what do we look, what are we looking at? Uh, thank you, Paritosh, for the topic and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to speak to you about red or yellow spots seen on the fundus examination. What's that? Now, when I was given this topic, I started thinking and I thought that everything in the retina that you get, pre-retinal, intraretinal, subretinal, everything is yellow or red. Ma maximally, it can be black somewhere. It can be brown somewhere. It can be white. But majority is white, yellow and red. So. I didn't know how to do this, but I hope I can do some justice to it. So this is how it would appear, whether we are talking about hemorrhages, we are talking about abnormal growths, we are talking about m m aneurysms, which can be macro or micro, or it could be cotton wool spots or hard exudates. Now the important thing is that if we label it together, red spots, hemorrhage, microaneurysms, microaneurysms, new vessels, macular hole, cherry red spot. If you talk about yellow spots, it's hard exudate, soft exudate, drusen, RP atrophy, scars, CNVM, CRA patches, flex, egg yolk appearance. And if you talk about both, there are conditions in which you get both, which you have to label, which is, could be a diabetes, hypertension, uh, age-related macular degeneration, PCV, CMV retinitis, or a CRVO. So the thing is that important thing is that when you get red or yellow spots, and especially this is for the postgraduates who are just learning to start uh, seeing these lesions, you have to identify it by a systematic manner. That is, you take a very careful history. So the history gives you half the diagnosis, whatever it is. Especially recurring conditions like diabetes, hypertension, these are common things. So you have the first differential of this in your mind. Go to the depth, whether it is superficial or deep. If it is exudates, see whether it's a soft exudate, which is superficial in the nerve fiber layer, or if it is in a deeper level where it could be hard exudates in the outer plexiform layer. If you have a color and configuration, you have very shiny, yellow, discrete, hard exudates. If you have something pale, yellow, irregular margins, variable shape, superficial, soft exudates. If you have a dress, drusen, light, yellow, round, fluffy, or discrete, you know this could be a drusen at a little deeper level. Then come to hemorrhages. It could be flame-shaped, su superficial, flame-like, red, dot and bloat, little more uh, uh, round or a little fuzzy, and a little deeper layer, rod spots, where you could have a flame shape with a center, which is particularly uh, uh, particular to certain diseases like uh, endocarditis or even in other conditions like anemia and all, you can get it. And deep, you have to see whether it is deep in the pre-retinal, that is different. They have all spoken about pre-retinal. I'm not going to touch that. Sub-retinal, sub-RP, or it is in the choroidal layer. Now, on the right, you see these flame-shaped hemorrhages, which are superficial. You have the dot and blot over here, which is a little deeper. And this is the shiny hard exudates, which is, again, in a slightly deeper layer. So one has to get to know. Do an indirect ophthalmoscopy, because that gives you a 3D uh, picture. And you know what level the uh, lesion is at, so you are better to mesh it. 
Now, retinal vascular diseases is what comes to your mind when you think of exudates, hemorrhages, hard, soft, and all the other things. So, a typical hard exudate, shiny, circinate rings, or it could be pale yellow, which is cotton wool spots. Again, dot and blot hemorrhages. Microaneurysm, small round pinpoint near the capillaries, small uh, lesions, and otherwise, uh, you know, uncombined occlusions. Or you have superficial hemorrhages, which is accompaniment of any uh, RVOs. And then you have vascular loops, beadings. These are all things which are red lesions on the eye, typical of a vascular disease. Mactel, where you get a small round with a halo around it, or you have coats where there's a lot of exudation involving the center, and these exudations need not only be in the center, it can be in the periphery also. So multiple causes, I mean, the list of causes is endless. Diabetic retinal vascular disease, ocular ischemic syndrome, sickle cell retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, I'm getting tired of telling you all, all this. And the bacterial endocarditis where you get the typical rot spots and then come to the lesser causes then you come to the age related degenerations the juxtaphobial telling the or the pcv which have a different format altogether and in children do not forget if you see hemorrhage in a child where there is no history of any other problem it's a shaken baby syndrome now embolizations can be from embolization of amniotic fluid uh, which can give rise to exudates. It could be infective, it could be toxic because of interferon or methotrexate, it could be radiation induced, it could be immune mediated because SLE, sarcoidosis, dermatomyositis, there's a host of conditions which can give you soft exudates. And when it comes to blood diseases like aplastic anemia, dysproteinemia, pernicious anemia, these are also known to give various kind of similar kind of lesions. So basically, if you have to know what belongs to what, it is like if you have three karobis in a room and you want to know kar karobi lahiri, you have to fit her characteristics to that. That is, she's fat, she's fair, she limps, all these things you have to put, okay, this is karobi. So similarly, when you want to stratify a condition, you see the accompaniments along with it and the natural history, what you get on your examination, what you order in a meshed form in your investigations and that is when you decide, okay, I'm dealing with this, this is the form of treatment which I would offer which would work best for the patients. And then there are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories which can give rise to bleeds in the eye. There are several other medications. So the history is of prime importance because you have to take all these histories. The interferons which are given for viral infections also can be linked to eye bleeding. So now let's go over and just see the photographs of these people. This is a branch retinal vein occlusion, lot of superficial hemorrhages. Go to the next, it's a macroaneurysm involving the first main this and you see a yellowish spot surrounded by red along an arteriole and this has given rise to resultant uh, features at the macula, but this is classically a macroaneurysm, CRVO, where you see a central kind of hemorrhages, exudates all over, all in the superficial layer. The macula is also involved in this. And then a combined BRAO and BRVO, which you see that there is an occlusion, you can see an umbilus somewhere, somewhere, and you know that you're dealing with uh, uh, this. The CRAO, which is the emergency, where if you notice it, you can give relief, some relief to the patient if you do a paracentesis within the first three hours. And uh, the other methods of pushing the embolus out works in some, doesn't work in some. And this is the CRAO, another picture of the same. So the thing is that when you see these conditions, you know that there is a systemic problem which has to not only be addressed with you, but you need an associated physician to be able to tell you how, guide you how you have to control this. Because it is like, you know, sort of mopping up a wet floor. If you don't stop the floor, you're going to keep on mopping up for your life. And as it is, it takes a very long time to mop up everything. So tell the patient to get his diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, whatever it is in order. S speak to the physician, see that uh, they get the proper line on the road. And for yourself, you can do the relevant investigations which are required and start the treatment according to whatever you see. Now, if you see this, this is dot blot hemorrhages, flame-shaped hemorrhages. There's a lot of edema in the center. Do an OCT, g see what is the, uh, this like. And then you might resort to anti-VEGF treatments or steroid, uh, you can inject, st inject steroids. Or sometimes when it is localized lesions, you can uh, get away with a laser treatment. And then you have to watch what is the 
uh, condition going to fare like. So these are all other pictures which tell you the same, the severity. And you know, what is the severity? Now this is a plaque like, uh, uh, this is a very dense plaque which is at the macula. You have to prognosticate to the patient that his visual, this however much you do is not really going to be great at the end of it. So these are things that you learn when you sort of see these patients because you have to talk to the patients and you have to give him a kind of a realistic attitude about what is happening. Again, new vascularization, I'm not going to get into this. Hypertensive retinopathy, a conglomerate of uh, soft exudates, flame-shaped uh, uh, hemorrhages. Uh, uh, you know that and the hypertension history, you know we are dealing with this. If you get some exudates coming to the macula, you know that it's uh, going into the phase of a malignant type of hypertension. These are other senatin pictures of hypertensive retinopathy, the malignant hypertension where your disc is also edematous, you might get hemorrhages. The central retinal artery occlusion, which is a cherry red spot, again a red spot on the eye, but you get a surrounding uh, kind of white uh, area, so you know that you're dealing with this. This is the branch arteriola, affects the arteriole, and it's along a segment, the rest of the retina looks okay. Central retinal vein occlusion, superficial hemorrhages, overriding the macula. And then the branch vein occlusion, where it's affecting a branch of the vein, and you know that this is how it is. Then coming to your ARMD, you see where the lesion is, a grayish kind of a lesion, it might be yellowish, and situated in the deeper retinal layers. The, there are hard exudates surrounding it, and uh, it appears grayish, so you know that there is fluid. Drusen, which is again in the deeper layers, it's uh, like the, uh, 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 is the first uh, dry kind of ARMD that we are talking about. Or the wet AMD, which is on the right hand side, if you see this lesion, you see different shades. This is in the ret uh, like pre retinal, this is sub retinal, and this is in the deeper layer. And this, if you see, is these huge lesions are generally related to the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathies. Pre retinal subhyoid hemorrhage can be traumatic, can be because of other systemic causes. This is a systemic cause because you get a lot of exudation over it. Then then we come to the relatively cool things where you get these yellow spots, which could be retinal dystrophies, degenerations, whether it is a stargards and along with certain flecks on the retina, uh, or there is drusen, or there is an adult vitelliform where you get a small kind of yolk-like thing. These are all lesions which appear like this, but you have to see the level and decide what we are talking about because these don't require any form of acute treatment. And this is fundus flammulomaculitis, which uh, uh, often accompanies the Stargardt's disease. Now, a egg, egg yolk appearance characteristic, you know that you're talking about uh, best vitelliform de degeneration in the early stages. Later, it is replaced, and it doesn't look yellow, so it's not under my purview. Something like this appearing red in the peripheral retina, they've already spoken about. Retinal tears, starting with a detachment, you have to treat immediately. Inflammatory conditions, again appearing yet, but in the deeper plane. The FFA helps you to find out what it is, categorize, because if you get a typical uh, kind of fluorescein pattern, you know that you're dealing with this. And so, as well as the other conditions, like the APMPP, the mutes, and the toxoplasmosis, where there, are, there is scarring, but in the initial phase, you just see it as a yellow blob. And uh, this is old, and some scars are there, but there are some fresh lesions of toxoplasma, punched out lesions are there. Chloroquine maculopathy, history of chloroquine intake, bullseye appearance, which appears something like this. It not, need not be classically brown. It can sometimes appear like this. CMV retinitis, again, it's a tomato cats, uh, ketchup appearance with blood and uh, uh, soft exudates. And connective tissue disorders, you get some whitish lines or red lines, which could be angioid streaks. So, and then coming to tumors, these tumors are rather large, but you can get smaller areas. That is, it could be a metastatic lesion, it could be a leukemic retinopathy, or it could be a retinoblastoma. Again, this is a huge lesion. You can't miss it, but sometimes there are small things, especially if you see the other eye of the patient, you'll find probably a small lesion in the periphery, which is very important to treat immediately, because otherwise this child will land up with this kind of problem, requires all the kinds of subtenance injections of uh, the chemotherapeutics and uh, radiation, et cetera, for this patient, and sometimes enucleation of the eye. 
So these are emergencies, that is the CRAO, BRAO, BRVO, CRVO, AMD, PCV, BRVO, retinal tear. Now the thing is when I may say emergencies, I mean emergency from the point of view of the patient because he has suddenly lost his vision. It may not be, it may be a relative emergency for you, but for the patient, it's a true emergency. Then purchase, if injury, traumatic macular holes, and relative in injuries where we think relative, again in a macular hole, but the patient will complain of a black scotoma, diabetic macular edema, bleeds anywhere, which especially involving the macula, CMV retinitis, choroiditis, and posterior scleritis, where it is hazy and you see a yellow region over there. These are all non-emergencies, dystrophies, colobomas, degenerations, myelinated nerves. Myelinated nerves, you have to be sure that, you know, it's in the superficial plane. Don't mistake it for, because many a times people have had a melee of, uh, uh, of uh, investigations because they thought there was some kind of an osteoma or something at the back. And how do you manage? You identify the cause, relevant investigations, documentations, where the ocular systemic and treat and plan, both the ocular and systemic have to be addressed. So the uh, steps Maybe are the same, diagnosis, you do a detailed eye examination, and then you do your investigations like GONIO, B-scan, FFA, color photo, OCT or OCTA. The systemic workup is important. Uh, because this is very important from the patient's cardiovascular risk factors have to be addressed. And if uh, it's a CRU, treat it. If it's a lattice, treat it. And treatment is generally runs on to laser photocoagulation, intravitreal injections of anti vegfs steroids, surgery, cryotherapy, and medical line of therapy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karobi, for a very uh, uh, for a very exhaustive list. But uh, thank you for uh, uh, you know converting a very abstract topic into a beautiful painting. You did it very well. Uh, so, uh, in the limited time available, let's go through some of the uh, danger findings and uh, uh, you know what they led to. Uh, they say the eyes are the windows uh, to the soul, but the retina acts as a window not only to the brain and the nervous system, but to all major organs of the body. Because here, for example, you see your veins, but that's through the skin. But when you look at the fundus, you're actually looking at the status of the blood vessels. Okay, So uh, whatever is happening in all the major organs of the body, you're able, uh, with regards to the blood vessels, you're able to make out uh, uh, in the fundus itself. Uh, uh, fundus examination is a uh, you know privileged window which reveals a lot of uh, things not only about the vasculature but often about certain infectious diseases. Uh, only thing is that uh, particularly for the residents and the younger uh, uh, ophthalmologists, uh, protect yourself, okay? Use a binocular indirect ophthalmoscope and wear a mask. Uh, there are a lot of instances of uh, residents uh, going down with uh, tuberculosis, for example, in our country. Uh, so here's an example of a Holland horse plaque, but not causing uh, an occlusion. But this, uh, both these patients, uh, they're separate patients. They need to be worked up uh, to look for sources of emboli. Uh, this was a patient with peripheral uh, dot and blot hemorrhages. Uh, this patient uh, underwent carotid Doppler and was uh, detected to have an 81.4% blockage on uh, this side. Uh, the other patient, uh, you know, like uh, Dr. Karobi mentioned about white-centered hemorrhages which you find in bacterial septicemia and endocarditis, uh, rarely you get red-centered hemorrhages. So this patient had a rare uh, uh, blood dyscrasia. Uh, now, this was a patient who presented with an impending central retinal vein occlusion. Uh, he was a known diabetic hypertensive dyslipidemia, but through the workup, nephropathy was picked up. Uh, good systemic control and addition of pentoxifiline uh, and topical difluoridinate helped to uh, start resolving the macular edema. 
uh, uh, this uh, patient, this diabetic presented with a retinal arteriolar macroaneurysm, uh, which I lasered as seen in this uh, other picture because already there was some amount of subretinal hemorrhage here. Uh, but through the workup, uh, hypertension got uh, picked up. Uh, this lady presented with a macular star. Uh, she had uh, severe hypertension and uh, renal artery stenosis got picked up, which just with medical treatment, you can see things resolved. Uh, here's a patient where uh, it's a uh, ischemic central retinal vein occlusion and it's causing uh, arteriolar ischemia also, which is evident from the uh, OCT, where you see increased hyperreflectivity in the inner retinal layers. Okay, so that signifies ischemia, severe ischemia from the arterial side also. Uh, now, this lady had a branch, macular branch retinal vein occlusion. On workup, she was found to be dyslipidemic as well as uh, very high uh, homocysteine levels. Correction of that uh, led to resolution of the edema and uh, no further occlusions. She also had a past history almost 10 years before she presented of cerebral sinus venous thrombosis also. Uh, this gentleman uh, on workup, I mean, uh, you can see he's got a central retinal vein occlusion as well as a branch retinal vein occlusion. He had an antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, this person had uh, bilateral uh, CRVO and was found to have sleep apnea. Correction of that, uh, at least for the right eye, it uh, led to resolution of the uh, edema and resolution of the uh, impending ischemic type of CRVO, which he had in the other eye. Other eye, of course, I had to give him anti-VEGF injections. I even did a PRP for him. Uh, this was a lady with uh, diabetes, dyslipidemia, sleep apnea, uh, and sleep apnea uh, probably was also for some reason causing a nocturnal hypotension. So she presented with ischemic central retinal vein occlusion. Uh, she was injected with an anti-VEGF aflibercept. Then uh, she presented with a central retinal artery occlusion. Uh, so here, while doing uh, her FFA and multimodal imaging, I found some kind of a thick vitreous band, almost like a fibrous band going across the optic uh, cup. So I suggested to them whether we can, you know, give a trial of uh, some kind of a vitrectomy with some kind of a retinal angioplasty, which was performed uh, and uh, we had a modest improvement in vision. Uh, here is a patient with a combined central retinal vein occlusion and a cilio retinal artery occlusion. You can see the dense hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal surface. Uh, this was an elder cousin brother of mine. I was examining his fundus, found an embolus uh, in one of the macular branch uh, uh, br branches, and by the time I could take him to the fundus camera and photograph it, it was already gone. Uh, uh, but then we worked him up and he had severe carotid stenosis. He had to undergo a carotid endartrectomy, uh, but that saved him from a stroke. He's still alive and kicking about three years after uh, this event. Uh, this was a patient uh, who had undergone ureteric stenting uh, a few, uh, a couple of years ago, and he just came walking, no fever, nothing, just said that I'm seeing hazy in both my eyes. And uh, uh, you see in these OCTs that the growth is coming in from the choroid, okay? So this was a case of fungal dissemination, which was uh, traced back to the ureteric stent, which had to be removed. He had to be given systemic antifungals, uh, and he resolved well. We'll skip some of these uh, slides. Here was a child who had no history of fever, but just becoming little dull, not wanting to go out and play. Uh, and uh, she had uh, some of these uh, lesions. Uh, some scarred, pigmented scarred lesions were also there, but there were some active lesions also. So she turned out to have miliary tuberculosis, which healed with just uh, nine months AKT. In retinal uh, or ocular tuberculosis, we prefer to give nine months of AKT as against the classic six months of AKT. Uh, 
no systemic steroids were required. Uh, this was another patient who presented with a recent drop in vision and he had some irregularity of the RPE at uh, the fovea and uh, he was investigated man 2 strongly positive igra very high and in a diabetic patient so he's been started on akt now this is a patient with a peri optic nerve outer retinal necrosis which was uh, due to toxoplasmosis it resolved with just a good systemic anti-toxoplasma treatment. Here's a lady with uh, peripheral uveitis. Uh, in our country, commoner ones are due to tuberculosis, but this was because of toxoplasmosis. With treatment, you can see it's left behind some scarring, but with good pigmentation and resolved completely with good vision return. Uh, this is a patient with some RP irregularities here, better made out on fundus autofluorescence and he, uh, he was man to negative but HRCT chest uh, revealed lymph node uh, enlargement and uh, very high serum ACE and was diagnosed to have sarcoid. These lesions eventually resolved with steroid treatment. Uh, syphilis is making a comeback, uh, so beware uh, granularity on the surface of the retina within the vitreous and irregularity and granularity in the photoreceptors uh, uh, with focal losses of photoreceptors and uh, RP and uh, classic pattern on fundus autofluorescence. Okay? So uh, these uh, patients, we need to be aware of these patients because they can be great masqueraders. Uh, this is another masquerader. Uh, the patient was being treated for pars splenitis or vitri and vitritis with steroids, but uh, she had a classic lumpy bumpy RP and uh, 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 the aqueous scent for uh, uh, certain PCR studies, MYD mutation, uh, it was positive and uh, uh, vitrectomy was done. The vitreous biopsy was positive for uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma. Uh, this was a senior pathologist who was sent for surgery for retinal detachment. No break was found, but it was the autofluorescence which saved the day and I didn't end up operating him unnecessarily. Uh, you can see somewhat a lumpy bumpy uh, uh, RPE. Uh, so this was a case of uveal uh, effusion syndrome. Um, uh, thank you very much. I think time is up. If there are any questions, uh, I think the next session people are already here. Uh, you can, uh, 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 sorry, I think I can state my, ek minute on karenge please. Ek minute. Sir, cut Yahan pe bhi ka. Uh, you may uh, please, uh, if any of you is interested in the uh, uh, PDFs of uh, any, uh, any of the speakers presentations, kindly email me. I'll be happy to send it to you. And if you have any questions, I think we all can leave the hall to the next uh, people and uh, we can answer them outside. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I thank uh, our uh, uh, speakers, our faculty for excellent presentations. And I thank the audience for their uh, presence right up to the end and the audiovisual people. And of course, the AIOC. Thank you.